Well, um, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks to the Stanford Health Library. Thank you also for coming. And um, uh, I, we've been chatting about it before we started, but uh, for posterity, because these videos stay up for a while, that tonight is the final presidential debate uh, between Donald J. Trump and Hillary Clinton. This day may be remembered for a long time. Um, so again, the title of my talk was uh, Making Sex Comfortable Again After Menopause, Laser Treatment for the Vagina, but sh probably a shorter and better title would be Making the Vagina More Comfortable, because actually I'm going to be talking about a novel technology that isn't only for sexually active people, it's for potentially any woman who's suffering from um, vulvovaginal atrophy or, or thinning and dryness of the tissues which occurs commonly after menopause. There are a lot of causes of what we would call vaginal atrophy. Um, those things can, and vaginal atrophy again is thinning, dryness. Uh, there are a lot of symptoms that can be associated with this. It can be um, brought on by natural menopause, but also by surgical menopause or medical menopause, such as with oophorectomy and somebody who's had the ovaries removed during surgery. Um, patients who have undergone cancer treatments with pelvic radiation. Medications such as anti-estrogens, which are commonly used for hormone-sensitive breast cancers, for example. Even transient menopause can occur with such things as breastfeeding. Um, there are a lot of symptoms related to vaginal atrophy that affect perhaps up to 50% of menopausal women at, at some time in their life. And uh, these include vaginal dryness, also even externally dryness around the introitus or opening of the vagina, vaginal burning, vaginal itching, pain, which could either be a discomfort that's notable even when you're not engaged in sexual activity or as what we would call dyspareunia or pain with sexual activity. And this doesn't even necessarily mean penetrating vaginal intercourse, any kind of touching or intimacy activity. Bleeding with sexual intercourse is also a common finding in patients with severe atrophy. Your UTIs or urinary tract infections, much more common in postmenopausal uh, women or even the sensation of urinary tract infections. Commonly we see people that come in with complaints of burning with urination, what they would call dysuria, uh, where the symptom is there but the cultures are negative. And then there are other uh, sequelae or, or side effects of vaginal atrophy, including constriction or narrowing and tightening of the vagina, which can, make, um, which can also be uncomfortable but also make intercourse uh, difficult. And then urinary urgency and frequency, the, the feeling like you always gotta rush to the bathroom Sometimes that's not a problem of the bladder itself, but more uh, related to atrophy because there are estrogen receptors in the uh, bladder basin in the vagina underneath the bladder in your urethra. So there are a lot of therapies for vaginal atrophy, many that have been around and are standard for a long time. Uh, I think most people are familiar with vaginal estrogens. Um, there's also hormone replacement therapy that's oral or otherwise transdermal patches. Um, but there's vaginal estrogens that come as creams or tablets, things like that. These are a few of them listed here, Vagifem, Premarin cream, Estrace cream, or Estring to, to name a few. Um, there are vaginal moisturizers. These are non-hormonal moisturizers, a lot like lotion for your hands, but obviously for the, for the vaginal area, such as Replens. Um, there are vaginal lubricants, such as uh, Peugeot, Astroglide, things like that. And then uh, a more recent medication that's been FDA approved for um, vaginal atrophy is called Osfina. That's the, well, that's the market name of it. That's Ospemaphine, which is a selective estrogen receptive, uh, receptor modulator. Kind of in the same family as uh, uh, some of the, like tamoxifen and um, various kind of hormone-based therapies for breast cancer. It acts as an estrogen on the vagina, but an anti-estrogen elsewhere. Quick comment about hormone replacement therapy, which is commonly um, used for vulvovaginal atrophy. A lot of studies have looked at how effective that is compared to vaginal creams like Estrace or Premarin cream, and it turns out that localized cream is more effective um, than oral hormone replacement therapy and has lower risks of side effects. So um, obviously women might be on hormone replacement therapy for other reasons, but vaginal estrogen cream is, is to this point in time been considered the standard of care. So this is just a little more background. What used to be called, or is still called by many people, vulvovaginal atrophy was actually given a, uh, a new name by one of the academic societies that deals most frequently with menopause, and it's now called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Part of the reason was that gets more at the um, 
the symptoms that can occur in the area. Vulvovaginal atrophy just means thinning, but doesn't get to the fact that there can be um, urologic, I guess you could call it, sequelae as well. But genitourinary syndrome of menopause, it's a suite of conditions, and it's related to thinning or atrophy of the vulvovaginal tissues, which is due to a decrease in circulating estrogen uh, levels that occurs during menopause. Again, that could be natural menopause, surgical, uh, medical menopause, whatever. Previous work, and I have some colleagues that I, I collaborate with as well in uh, Italy, but previous histologic evaluation of the vaginal tissue after uh, novel therapies like fract with the use of fractional CO2 lasers, which is what I'm going to concentrate my talk on today, have demonstrated some regeneration of the connective tissue in the vaginal uh, skin, basically, in the, in the uh, layer just beneath the outer skin, which can lead uh, to an improvement without a lot of peripheral tissue damage. This has actually been known for quite some time, and uh, various lasers, including CO2 lasers, have commonly been used in plastic surgery, dermatologic surgery, and we use them in gynecologic surgeries for other conditions in, in different forms. Um, the uh, laser that I'll talk about that we did re the first US trials on, sorry, I think I have a microphone right here, I don't wanna put my hand over it, is, is the SmartSide 2 V2LR laser, and they gave it a name because it was uh, developed in Italy, uh, the Mona Lisa Touch laser. And that's a fractional CO2 laser. It's a system that has a maximum power of about 60 watts, and it emits laser energy at 10,600 nanometers. That's a wavelength absorbed by uh, water, for instance. This is a picture of the Mona Lisa Touch uh, laser. We have this here at Stanford now. Um, we were using this first. We were the first uh, U.S. center to have this and used in a study that I'll talk about a little later in, a, um, in some research trials. But this is uh, now available. It's actually FDA approved, broadly speaking, you know, for gynecologic um, uh, uses for incision, ablation, and so forth, and is currently seeking specific FDA approval for genital urinary syndrome of menopause. So um, this new therapy um, is, is quite different than using a hormone um, twice a week or every day or whatever is prescribed and then having to stick with it for the rest of your life. This is a treatment that's performed using a thin vaginal probe right in the clinic. It doesn't require any anesthesia. It's right in the clinic. It doesn't hurt at all, actually. It feels like a small vibration. And the way we've studied it and the way it's been um, evaluated, there are now 16, 15 published trials, one just accepted, so there will be 16 uh, soon. Um, with three treatments spaced about six weeks apart. Uh, the laser treatments, as I had mentioned, are relatively painless. The, the place where people may have a little discomfort, it depends on how um, kind of narrow the vaginal opening is. So for people with very narrow vaginas, while the probes aren't very wide, that may be a little uncomfortable because you can't use a lubricant to uh, put the probe in place. But uh, the probe itself is smaller than, than uh, many things that uh, may be inserted into the vagina, I guess you could say. So no anesthesia is required. It's performed in the office. The treatments, I say here, they take less than two minutes. Actually, on average, the treatments take us about 45 seconds if we're just treating the, the inside of the vagina. And the only restriction, actually, there's no special preparation prior to the treatment. You come in, you can get treated. And um, the only uh, thing we've been asking of uh, people who have this done is to avoid sexual intercourse for about three days afterward. And that's just based on some common sense. Nobody's shown that it's dangerous to do that but it would make sense that you'd want the area to heal for a few days. So let's hope this works, but I have a little um, video of the laser. This is the probe that goes into the vagina. There's different probes, by the way, with different shapes. This has a pyramidal mirror on it that deflects the laser into four separate directions, and it leaves a little pattern. It almost looks like if you had a Band-Aid on, and you pull the Band-Aid off, it leaves little tiny dots. You can see the micro patterns here. The laser um, is spaced so that it only treats about 6.7% of the entire skin of the vagina but it induces a healing phenomenon, and that's how it works. So this is very different than um, resurfacing that one might have, for instance, on the face where all of the skin is ablated. This is very tiny pinpoint holes, microscopic ones that are uh, made by the laser and not very deep. So uh, this is the, well, it's either the fun part or the boring part, depending on your perspective, I guess. But this works uh, via a variety of mechanisms that have been characterized now in some, in some basic uh, studies. Um, there's an effect of this laser on a variety of cytokine and growth factors with the increase in cytokines following treatment. There are, um, they're listed here. I don't know how interesting. This is a talk that I also have, have slides that I give to you know, researchers and physicians. But um, different um, 
Um, cytokines and growth factors that are affected listed here include transforming growth factor B, which stimulates the matrix proteins. It stim stimulates synthesis of those, such as collagen. Collagen is the connective tissue that holds us together. Um, there's some fibro, uh, basic fibro fibroblast growth factor, um, which stim stimulates this angiogenic activity. That's the growth of new blood vessels and endothelial cell migration and pr proliferation. Endodermal growth factor is affected, which stimulates re-epithelialization or a new layer of outer skin. Uh, Platelet-derived growth factor as well is affected, which stimulates fibroblasts to produce this extracellular matrix, which I have a picture of next, kind of the substance underneath the, the cells. And then um, vascular endothelial growth factor, again, regulates um, growth of new blood vessels. And interestingly, that's a common thing. It, the menopausal atrophic skin, if you look under a microscope, which I have a lot of slides of that, has far less blood, blood supply than prior to menopause. In other words, there's way less blood uh, vessels and thinner mucosa or skin. This is uh, a picture of kind of the ground substance of um, under, under a great magnification under a microscope. But um, within the ground substance, there are these core proteins and these uh, glycosamine glycans and other uh, aggregated proteoglycans and things like that that actually attract water into the skin. Um, and, um, and so um, this is, uh, much of this is improved. And we'll be starting a study here at Stanford. Some studies have been done in Europe and, and some animal models too, where we're going to be looking at what happens um, at the cellular level, at the molecular level, including in the basement membrane in patients that are um, treated with a laser. So uh, these are, this is just a small slide of the effects of the Mona Lisa Touch laser on kind of very thin postmenopausal skin. But um, studies have shown, and we'll be looking a little bit more deeply at the fact that there seems to be an increased collagen pr uh, production. And there are different types of collagen, collagen but this is um, organized collagen, uh, much more similar to pre a premenopausal state, which leads to be better mechanical support. I'm not suggesting this is a primary treatment for pelvic organ prolapse, but I can assure you people are looking at all of these various things. There's um, increased acidic mucopolysaccharides in the ground substance, which leads to better mucosal hydration uh, and permeability to nutrients and hormones. Sorry about the misspelling there. Increased glycogen content and delivery that um, I'll show you some pictures of, but it has that uh, helps improve the, the bacteria within the vagina that normally live there, including increased lactobacilli activity. And in one of the trials we did, we actually measured vaginal pH and showed a great decrease. Younger, younger people have a, a, a lower pH prior to menopause than after, which is why certain vaginal infections like bacterial vaginosis may be more common as one goes through the menopause. So I'll show you some pictures here. Again, this, this, this part, um, I kind of like pretty pictures, but uh, it's not as fun, I guess, as talking about what we found in our trials and surgical videos and things like that. Um, this is just to get us oriented. This is a picture of the vaginal skin, the vaginal mucosa, which is very different than the skin of the face and other areas. Um, on the bottom is the connective tissue layer here, and above it is the epithelium. And in this picture, this is a, a picture you can see there's a thickened epithelium, which is sloughing. And the, the cells at the top there, so I don't have a pointer, um, look like they're mostly white. That's the high glycogen uh, and kind of water content in premenopausal skin. And, and this is what premenopausal um, vaginal mucosa or skin looks like. It's got a nice plush epithelium, like I said. It's also got these waves in it called these reedy pegs. Um, and, um, um, and then there's a rich uh, blood supply, which are, these are cross sections of blood vessels here. As a contrast, here is progressively worse skin, vaginal mucosa after the menopause. And you can see that it looks very, very different with a very thin and progressively thinning and collapsing uh, vaginal mucosa or epithelial layer. And the connective tissue uh, also uh, looks very different. There's not these vacuolated cells that uh, look like they have the white rings around it. There's much less uh, water and much less glycogen and much less sloughing, actually, which is what causes vaginal lubrication. So I have a series of pictures. Tell me if they, uh, if, if they make sense or not. But um, these are pictures uh, up at your left is at baseline prior to treatment. In the middle, is this is the same patient. This is one month after treatment number one. And I'll talk about this. There's usually three treatments in series. 
and then this is one month after the second treatment. And you can see, particularly at the top, that kind of darker pink area is the very, very thin um, epithelium or external kind of skin, the part that is in the vagina. You can see that in the next, if, even after one treatment, a significant uh, improvement in the thickness, as well as these new uh, reedy pegs, a little bit of improvement in vascularization as well. And then you can see these nice deep papilla in the, in, in thickened, um, and thickened kind of epithelium after treatment number two, and um, that would continue after treatment number three. Um, again, similarly, baseline up to the left and after treatment one and two here. Um, with some pictures that show a little bit of uh, closer up of the thickening of the epithelium. Um, and this is just before treatment three. One thing that I like this, I, just, I know that they're similar, but in, in, in this slide, I think you can, you can see that there's an increase in kind of glycogen uh, content and hydration. Um, and this is at a higher magnification yet still. And I, I would, and this is the same patient, I would argue that the the epithelium in the, at the uh, outer layer there is, uh, is much plusher, as I think you can tell, uh, after treatment. And this is just one month after the second treatment than it is before. Um, this slide shows uh, angiogenesis. There's actually been shown to be growth of new blood vessels to the epithelium, which increases permeability uh, after treatment. Um, and um, there, there usually is a loss of that, which leads to very fragile skin in, in um, in postmenopausal women, um, but we get a lot of uh, neovascularization after uh, treatment with the pulsed CO2 laser. I think this is my last pretty slide. I just like the stain on this one, kind of more Halloweeny or something. But so atrophic on the left, and, and the same mucosa two months after the second treatment with a, different strains, which show clearly the basement membrane, the reedy pegs, um, and very glycogenated, well hydrated mucosa, and. This at the top is important. That's the sloughing of the external epithelial layer. Those cells that slough off with the, high, the um, vaginal um, lubrication often is what, what we would call uh, like an exudate. It's a, it's a fluid that's expressed from sloughing skin cells externally. And so lubrication is often greatly enhanced after treatment with uh, the uh, pulse CO2 laser. Um, so anyway, this increased permeability of this rehydrated extracellular matrix, which I showed you a picture of before, really helps facilitate diffusion of nutrients and minerals, ions, salts, hormones, vitamins, antibodies, and so forth, um, from the blood vessels to the tissues of the vaginal wall. And, and, and that includes the skin itself, the epithelium, the connective uh, tissue mucosa, uh, muscles, and so forth. I guess I had one more picture I didn't even realize. Well, same, same story. Again, a picture of, uh, a picture of uh, neovascularization here, um, leading to increased permeability with a nicely rehydrated, rehydrated and glycogen-filled uh, epithelium. So now's the fun part, I think, because I don't find histology to be that in, uh, engaging. This is uh, something I just presented two weeks ago, so it's actually brand new. I just was in Denver at the American Urogynecologic Society, which is our largest academic meeting, and this is the first ever one-year outcome trial of the pulsed CO2 laser. So uh, myself and a colleague of mine, Dr. Mickey Karam in Cincinnati, did the first U.S. trial of this, um, of this therapy. We published a paper in Menopause, which is a, a great journal um, uh, of our three-month outcomes, and this is the first report of the one-year outcomes, which has just been submitted for publication and was just presented as an, as an oral presentation at a really big academic conference. The objective of our, of our study was to assess the safety and efficacy of the smart side to V2LR CO2 fractional CO2 laser for the treatment of genitourinary syndrome of menopause uh, one year after treatment. Again, that's a picture of the laser. We had um, a lot of different secondary outcomes because um, um, we were interested in the health of the vagina and sexual health and a variety of other things, including quality of life. So we assessed urogenital health using something called the, uh, it's the Bachman Vaginal Health Index. We also looked at vaginal elasticity. There are certain things on the market that use energy that say, this will make your vagina tighter. That's a, just exactly opposite of what one would want to do. Uh, Postmenopausal skin actually becomes tightened and, and very non-elastic. And so we assessed with the use of vaginal dilators, um, uh, the maximum tolerated dilator size before therapy and after each treatment and out to one year. Also, um, 
we assess sexual function with something called the Female Sexual Function Index. That's a commonly used, validated um, uh, measure of female sexual health uh, used across the world, uh, particularly in research trials. We assess general quality of life using something called the short form or SF12. And then we assess a variety of other measures, including the ease of the um, treatment, you know, how easy was the treatment for patients and physicians, using what we would call these Likert scales. They're five point uh, measures from, um, you know, very hard to very easy, for instance. Um, and then we assess patient satisfaction using a validated measure called the patient global impression of improvement. So we weren't just using our opinion, is what I'm trying to say. And I might say too, by the way, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I don't have stock in the company. They, they actually offered for me to be on the advisory board. I declined because we're doing research and that's a conflict of interest. So uh, no skin off my back not to use an analogy if it doesn't work, but we want to get to the truth and it really does seem that it does work well, but I don't have any disclosures. Um, so these are the methods of our small trial. This was a two, uh, two centers in the United States, um, like I said, myself and in Cincinnati. We enrolled a convenient sample of 30 consecutive women uh, who presented with genitourinary syndrome of menopause or significant vulvovaginal atrophy. And very importantly, uh, to be a part of this trial, you were not allowed to concurrently use vaginal lubricants. And there was a washout period for anybody that had been using vaginal estrogen creams so as not to confound the results of whether the laser worked or not. The patients were treated, as I mentioned before, with three laser treatments, and those were spaced about six weeks apart. They were seen at baseline. They were then uh, treated with the first treatment. We saw them a week after treatment to see, as this was brand new when we started, how they were doing. And then they came back for treatments two and three. They came back at three months, and then they came back at one year. And they did all of those health measures that I mentioned at each of the post-treatment visits and, and at baseline. So the visual analog scales uh, were used to grade all these symptoms of vaginal atrophy, including vaginal pain, vaginal burning, vaginal itching, uh, dryness, uh, dyspareunia, and dysuria or pain with um, urination. We then used the dye layers I had mentioned before, uh, which come from like extra small to extra large, and we used them to rate the vaginal elasticity uh, via the maximum size they could tolerate. Um, and uh, we did that at baseline in each follow-up visit. The vaginal health index was done, as I mentioned, as was the female sexual uh, function index, and satisfaction. Those were all um, what we measured. So this is a very short nutshell because most people just want to find out, does this work or not? Here's our results in an easy to digest format. I'd say in Trump's spirit, I'll, I'll state our uh, results bigly. <laughs> so, uh, and I don't mean to be braggadocious. <laughs> These are all the genitourinary syndrome of menopause symptoms uh, that we measured. Uh, pain, burning, itching, dryness, dyspareunia, and dysuria on the bottom there. On that, um, uh, the, the scales on the left from uh, zero to 10, as you can see. Um, and um, uh, the dark blue, if you can see it, is baseline before treatment. The middle uh, kind of lighter blue is uh, results at three months. And then the lightest is our 12 month outcomes. And, What's easiest to see is that uh, like baseline, three months, one year, you could see there was a significant improvement in uh, the symptoms uh, from baseline to one year. Significant improvement from baseline to three months, but most importantly, it seems like the results hold because after this third treatment, there was no more treatment and the patients couldn't use moisturizers or hormones. Uh, down here? Yeah. yeah, so that's a vaginal pain. Yeah, like Dis oh, I'm sorry. Dyspareunia is pain with sexual activity. And Dysuria is burning with urination. Okay. Yeah. So vaginal pain is without... That's without. That's just walking around. Something oh. is uncomfortable or hurts. Dyspareunia is specifically sexual-related pain. Um, so, so this is a slide which shows the results from the, uh, the vaginal dilators, looking at vaginal elasticity. Again, there are you know, certain devices, as I understand it, I haven't studied them on the market, that are touting vaginal tightening. And as I mentioned, this is not uh, what we were looking for, nor is that a good idea. But um, um, we were looking to see if patients could tolerate uh, more stretching in the vaginal canal, such as what occurred during sexual intercourse. So 79% uh, of the patients tolerated a medium or large dilator at our 12-month outcome, 
one year after treatment compared to only 20% at baseline. And again, the uh, same color scheme, there's baseline all the way on the left. Um, extra small dilator uh, is the um, darkest blue. A small dilator, which is at the baseline, was the most common dilator that patients could use prior to treatment. And then a medium and large dilator. But look what's, it's reversed. You can see at baseline, most of the patients tolerated a small dilator. When you get to three months after treatment, the majority could tolerate a, a medium or large dilator. And that held true uh, at 12 months. There was a slight diminution at 12 months with no further treatment, but still very significantly improved from baseline in the size of a dilator that somebody could comfort comfortably tolerate, which could be translated to the ability to have sexual intercourse. These are our 12-month uh, FSFI scores. FSFI, again, is the, the female sexual function index. It's a measure of, of the ability to um, have satisfactory sexual intercourse and doesn't even have to be intercourse, any sexual engagement. It's validated even for people who are not having vaginal intercourse. Um, and um, kind of the takeaway from the slide was that there, this is based on a scale. There was a, a huge improvement, a 10.63 point improvement on the FSFI with, uh, you could see at, at baseline, the average score was 11. And uh, at 12 months, the average score was 21, um, which means a lot to researchers in female sexual health. But it, in general, uh, means that uh, patients found that um, they had a vast improvement in sexual health after treatment with the pulsed CO2 laser. I might add, I don't have slides here because I took slides from a, a short oral presentation. We only had so much time. But we had a, a number of patients in our study that had not been able to be sexually active for several years prior uh, to starting the trial and after treatment were able to be sexually active, including some that could be sexually active with no pain at all. This is just an overall uh, slide that shows um, how many patients were either satisfied or very satisfied with the treatment. Um, and so uh, very satisfied um, is, is the 50% uh, that you can see uh, on the right. And then 42% were uh, satisfied. 8% were about the same. There were no patients in our trial that were dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the treatment. And that's, uh, particularly when, you, when you're looking, as I do often at novel technologies, that's an incredibly high rate of satisfaction. Uh, because remember, these were patients, many who had severe atrophy, hadn't been able to be sexually active, and almost half of our patients were cancer patients that could not take hormones um, that were very, very satisfied with the uh, outcomes of the treatment. So our conclusion from this uh, pilot study was that the SmartSide 2 V2LR fractional CO2 laser seems to be safe and efficacious for treatment of the symptoms of genitourinary syndrome of menopause with results that seem to last one year at least. Now, uh, I've, um, in, in collaboration with some colleagues in Italy, I've actually seen some of the patients that were coming back uh, after being partic uh, participants in research trials in Italy. And what a lot of them have um, uh, said to, to, to us and the research team was that they come back at one year and they say, I'm doing really, really well. Can you please redo the, just do it. It takes 35 seconds so that I can continue to maintain good results. Um, but we, in our study, even showed that over 80% of patients had a very significant improvement even after a single treatment. It's just not been studied that way, so it's studied with three treatments. But it's up to patients how many treatments they have if they're outside of a study. This slide just talks about a couple of trials that were um, just starting now. The first is called the VELVET study. It's an acronym, but any, anyway, what it is is a multi-center randomized controlled trial of this vaginal laser versus vaginal estrogen therapy. This trial will, uh, be, enroll will be enrolling 40 patients at, at Stanford, and there are 40 at five academic medical centers across the United States. And since it's randomized, the patients don't get to choose. They, they agree to be in the trial, and they're either randomly assigned to the one therapy or the other, vaginal estrogen or the laser, and will follow patients at six months. At the completion of six months, patients can choose to do whatever they like. And so if you were a patient and you were randomized, for instance, to the uh, estrogen group, you could decide outside of a trial to have the therapy if you wanted. Um, and so that's important to note, it doesn't preclude you from future therapies of any kind. As part of the trial, actually, the, all the treatments will be subsidized. So the patients won't have to pay for laser treatments. And there, I believe, is a stipend as well for those that are uh, going to be randomized to the estrogen group to try and eliminate any bias because I like one thing better because it's free, for instance. 
We're also starting a histology study. Uh, I had mentioned that before. There's uh, just a little bit of work that's been done looking more at a basic science level, what's happening. We're going to be enrolling um, uh, a few consecutive patients um, where we'll take very small pinch biopsies with a very standard little biopsy thing that's used uh, frequently in the vagina. Numb up a little spot, take a little biopsy. We're going to look at baseline at what the epithelium, like the slides I showed, looks like and do a variety of stains for collagen and other um, factors, looking at the other cytokines and factors that I had on the prior slide. And then we're going to treat those patients, and after each consecutive treatment, we're going to also be taking biopsies to look at the progression of what happens um, uh, histologically. Um, that's my research coordinator's phone number, Catherine Batham, uh, in case anybody's interested, but um, also the laser is now offered because it is FDA approved, broadly speaking, so it's offered outside of trials as well. Um, there are other uses for the CO2 laser, it seems, that are under study now. Um, there, um, we have some experience now, and some colleagues are also looking very specifically at external vulvar atrophy. Um, many women um, say, well, I have dryness in the vagina, and that can be treated with, again, hormone therapy, you know, preferably um, vaginal hormones, vaginal moisturizers. The laser, that's another treatment. Um, but then they say, things still bother me outside. Insertion during intercourse is the only part that hurts, for instance. And so the laser is now being looked at for that. Um, and it seems to have uh, uh, value. Uh, none of this has been published yet, so take everything with a grain of salt, I would say. But uh, it seems to hold great promise. Um, also, it's being looked at now in a large multi-center study for a very common skin condition called lichen sclerosis. Lichen sclerosis um, primarily affects uh, either uh, kids or postmenopausal women, and um, it's treated actually with high-potency steroids. I just had uh, earlier today a conversation with the head of the um, of the pediatric and adolescent gynecology division here at Stanford who expressed great interest in the possible use of the laser because you, you have to be on lifelong high-dose steroid uh, cream externally, which obviously is not an ideal solution, but it's the only real effective solution for lich lichen sclerosis. That's being looked at right now. There's also, um, yeah, there's two studies going on nationally right now. One that um, was just performed is a study for vestibulodynia. Vestibulodynia is pain of the vulvar vestibule, which means the outside and opening of the vagina, outside. And a publication was just accepted um, today or yesterday, actually, uh, for publication in looking at the use of the laser for this common pain condition. And then lastly, there's nothing published yet, but they've, they've seen some curious things, particularly in Europe, where they have a, a, a kind of a longer experience with use of these uh, CO2 lasers. Patients with certain types of urinary incontinence seem to complain of urinary incontinence yet uh, less a lot of urgency, frequency, or overactive bladder-related incontinence, and even some patients maybe with stress incontinence. But I really can't comment on that. It's not FDA approved for this. I haven't studied it for that, but that's something that's gonna be looked at in the future. Um, I put this slide in today just to remind me to rem let you know that there are a number of ongoing, brand, uh, ongoing trials and uh, uh, recently published trials. This top one was uh, just came out, I think, today. Um, and uh, this is a use of the fractional microblade of CO2 laser for vulvovaginal atrophy in patients treated with chemotherapy and or hormonal therapy for breast cancer, a retrospective study. This was just accepted for publication in menopause, and this seems to be very valuable. There are many patients that cannot take hormones. Those, for instance, with estrogen response of breast cancers would be an example, or other gynecologic mal malignancies. Those patients haven't had great options. They can try um, vaginal moisturizers and lubricants, but um, most of them um, have continued symptoms, and, can, and it can be very bothersome because many of those patients are even on anti-estrogens, and one of the common side effects is vaginal burning, itching, dryness, and so forth. Another really neat study, I think, that was just published uh, recently is the effect of microablative frac fractional CO2 lasers on vaginal flora of postmenopausal women. A big area of um, uh, investigation right now, even at the in National Institutes of Health related even to bladder conditions, is what we would call the microflora. It turns out that um, it's normal to have bacteria all over your body, including in the vagina. Same is true in the bladder. Re really neat um, data just recently has been uh, published by the National Institutes of Health 
looking at the microenvironment in the bladder. It turns out there are a lot of women with urinary urgency and frequency that commonly say, I feel like I have urinary tract infection, and then they come in and they get evaluated with urine cultures, and urine cultures are negative, and we say, no, you don't have an infection. It turns out that if you look with something called an extended culture, a research culture, um, there's a normal flora that you normally can't see that lives in the bladder, and it's perturbed in people with these symptoms. It turns out the same may hold true now for the vagina, and they've looked actually at the vaginal uh, flora of kind of healthy premenopausal women versus those that are postmenopausal. Remember I had said we looked actually in our trial at pH and the number of lactobacilli that live in the vagina is related um, and, and leads to a lower pH. And um, in this trial, after treatment with a fractional CO2 laser, they had a great improvement in the microflora or the um, vaginal flora of the vagina to much more normal premenopausal levels. So these are all new areas of investigation that seem to, like I said, seem to be very promising. That's my last slide uh, of the prepared things, uh, but um, I'm very happy to answer questions you might have more on the practical side. Uh, you know, how is this done? Does insurance cover it? You know, all of that stuff. And here's our contact information. Yes? Could you talk a little bit more about estrogen sensitive tumors uh, in cancer patients and how that translates later on into whether they can or cannot get into? Yeah, so, so the question was, can I, you know, comment on, you know, estrogen re uh, responsive tumors, uh, wh whether patients would qualify for some of these trials or not. Uh, is that correct? Yes, and because of the fear of reigniting right. the estrogen Correct, so because of the fear of, yeah, re reigniting these estrogen responsive tumors. So um, it depends on which study is the short answer. For the VELVET trial, the randomized trial that I had mentioned, one, if they uh, had an estrogen responsive cancer, would not be a candidate because they might be randomized into the estrogen arm of that trial. And, um, and therefore, um, we, we don't feel that's ethical nor safe to enroll patients with cancers in that trial. Um, but I'm aware that there, are, there is some new interest in patients like I mentioned with this one trial, cancer patients, and whether there may be a, a place specifically for cancer patients. This first uh, study was the first one that was published as a retrospective study of people with estrogen-responsive tumors. That was a retrospective study, but it stands to reason that the, the, the laser therapy should work similarly, regardless of one's cause of menopause. What we're also asked frequently about is patients who've undergone radiation therapy pelvic radiation, for instance, if one's had, say, cervical cancer. We've always had radiation therapy, therapy as an exclusion uh, from research studies for a variety of reasons, mostly because we're trying to get at um, the best population that the laser may be um, beneficial for and without um, extenuating circumstances like uh, severe atrophy from radiation that has no blood flow, things like that. That's also why we excluded women who, for instance, are using moisturizers and vaginal hormones. But I believe there may be a promise in studying even patients who have had pel pelvic radiation uh, with great care, though. Uh, these lasers have to be used at the appropriate settings. And with laser patients in particular, the mucosa or the skin is so very thin that it'd be easier um, if you had the settings, at high settings, 30 watts, 40 watts, that you could cause real bleeding or pain with the laser. And so we're very careful. We have very stringent criteria of the laser settings. Um, and if one is uh, contemplating having this done, you want to go to a center that I would think is adept at, at um, knowing what the proper settings for the proper patients are. We, we, um, I'm privy to some um, data that um, from investigators and colleagues uh, kind of across the world because there's a small group of us that are doing research on this. And, and we're actually uh, refining now what the, the proper settings are, for instance, for the external treatment versus internal treatment, severe atrophy versus not severe atrophy, cancer patients with very severe atrophy versus those that don't have it. So that's all being refined right now. But are you also taking into consideration the possible reigniting of the cancer mm -hmm. because the, the tumors were hormone receptors? We're definitely taking, so the question again, are we taking into consideration the possible kind of reemergence of tumors with estrogen? We are, I mean, actually, um, I mean, the whole concept of this takes that into consideration because this is no hormones. 
that's one of the important points of uh, uh, this novel treatment is no hormones are required. So this therapy should have no impact even in somebody who's undergoing active cancer treatment. So it's an option possibly for those patients. So much so that the uh, Division of Gynecologic Oncology at Stanford has just purchased the laser for themselves, which I thought was a little bit silly since we're right next door to each other. But nonetheless, there's a, a huge demand for um, alternative therapies besides hormones because of the risk of reemergence of cancers. Yes? So, uh, I think you said that only 6% of the vagina was affected by this fractal or... Fractional CO2, yep. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering, why such a small percentage? Why not 50%, for example, you know, right. of the vagina? Right. Wouldn't that even yep. be better? That's one question. The second question is, how effective is this uh, new treatment for uh, post-hysterectomy effectiveness? Okay. If you just have, like, a stop. And, I mean, does yep. it work on that yes. skin as well? Yep. Um, okay, that's it. So let me reiterate the two okay. questions. Maybe I've forgot, forgotten the, the first. Let's start with the second question. Okay. The second question you had was, how effective is this therapy for patients who have had a hysterectomy? Does it affect basically the, the top of the vagina? Yeah. That's a great question, actually. It turns out um, that the way the probe is designed, I'm going to go back in my slides um, to the video. Now, there are various shapes of this probe, but commonly used probes... Did I not get to it? Here, yeah, keep going. Boy, I had more slides than I thought. Here it is. If I go here, let's see if it plays. This probe, you'll notice, has a cap on it that stops the laser from shooting the cervix. And so what we're aiming at is the circular cylinder of the vagina as opposed to the cervix or the vaginal cuff scar. That's just a small area. The probe itself is not very big. It's just a, you know, maybe three centimeters across in its greatest diameter. So if you look at somebody who's had a laser, laser treatment, after they've had the treatment, which of course I've done a lot, you will see actually that the tube of the vagina after the treatment, you can see these little pattern dots, but nothing right at the apex. That's actually probably a good thing. The reason that may be a good thing is you never know what's stuck on the other side of a vaginal cuff scar. Small bowel is often stuck there, for instance, and you wouldn't want to... Um, um, if something were very thin, for instance, apply laser energy to a spot where there might be something right behind it. Although, to be sure, the laser doesn't um, fire deeply into the vaginal mucosa. Which brings me to another point, by the way. We can control how far the laser fires, how deep into the vaginal mucosa with something called stacking. So um, at the end of the video, you saw the, that cutaway of the laser firing. Stacking means if you have stack one setting, it means that the laser fires once in one spot. Stack two setting means in microseconds, it fires twice in the same spot, so it goes a little bit deeper. And stack three setting, even deeper. When we start treatment, if somebody has very severe symptoms and thinning of the tissue, we start at low settings. Just stack one with, with um, various settings that are lower power. Because we don't want to cause pain or bleeding. Um, but then, usually we find that at the second and third treatments, you can actually put the stack setting higher to get a little bit deeper so that you can affect deeper into the epithelium. Remind me of your second question again? The first question was, or the first why question. only 6%? Oh, okay. Yeah, why not more? Yes, the question, why, why would you only treat 65 or so percent of the vaginal mucosa? Why not the whole thing? That reminds me of the movie Spinal Tap. Do you remember that movie where they say, you know, the, you can turn the electric guitar up to 10, but they turn it up to 11. Well, it turns out that studies suggest, so all fractional CO2 lasers work similarly. They don't ablate entire, you know, they leave little spots. And um, some of the basic science work, which has been done in rabbits, shows um, that that's, that's the right amount of spacing, I guess you could say, of the fractional CO2 dots to induce a healing response. Our goal always is to use the least amount of energy possible to get the best response, minimizing patient risks. And, um, and, and whereas on, on a face, let's say you're trying to remove a pigmented lesion, a tattoo even, similar lasers are used at different wavelengths. You've, you've got to um, remo remove something. We're not trying to remove anything here. We're trying to just um, create a, a healing reaction. Another so, question. So to, oh. to clarify, the 6% is actually the measurement of each of those red dots. Yeah, it's the, exactly, it's the volume. I understood that. The, 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 
Yeah, the six percent is is the the whole percent of the entire surface area, I guess you could say, of the vaginal mucosa. Yeah, right. Another question in the back. So, Medicare. Medicare. Great question. So when we brought this into the university, uh, um, it's it's brand new. And um, anybody who, like I do who works in, and I didn't develop this, boy, I wish I did, but I develop a lot of other things. Um, uh, codes for procedures and, and insurance often lag many years behind the emergence of new technologies. So currently, insurance doesn't pay for this. So you would then would ask, well, how much does it cost? Uh, and it costs... Um, $900 per treatment, which is actually far less than everywhere else because I spoke with the university and I said, I, don't, I want this to be available to as many women as possible. The great hope for me is that insurance covers this. I work at Stanford where it doesn't matter what we do, we get, we get paid the same. I don't have incentives to do more or less. We can do the right thing. Um, if you go to Beverly Hills, you can pay $3,000 per treatment for this. Um, but the great hope, of course, is that this will be covered ultimately. And so do you do one-year touch-ups, so to speak? Do you, um, after your three months, and then you're good, and then do we come back every year for another last? That's a great question. The question is, do we do one-year touch-ups? I would say the, the real answer is we do what's best for patients. So if patients feel that they want to come back and have a touch-up, then absolutely we would. On the, on the, uh, on the flip side, uh, given that this is a real expense, um, and we realize that it's also not a hard thing to do. And so some patient, patients may elect to say, I feel fine and I don't want to spend any more money. Uh, and so I'm not going to have a one-year touch-up. It's very much dependent on your uh, symptoms. Yes, ma'am. Do you see a limitation of how often a woman could undergo this treatment? Okay, the question about a limitation of how often one could undergo this treatment. No, I mean, uh, I think <laughs> like the Greeks, I guess, say everything in moderation is probably true. Um, it's studied in a very particular uh, way, and all of the studies show very significant improvements. So, for instance, I would never say, come back once a week and we'll just continue to use the laser. Um, I don't see a limitation on the longevity of, of, of the, the, there's no reason that I could think, because we had not a single major adverse event in our trial. What do I mean by that? There was no patient with pain after laser burn, the only thing we had is about 10% of patients that have a transient, a little bit of discharge or a tiny little bit of bleeding or a little discomfort just with the insertion. Now, some patients that get the treatment of the, the uh, vulva on the outside may for a couple of days feel a little bit of burning externally. But um, um, when you look histologically, you don't, I don't see any reason that somebody couldn't have this repeated um, in the future, even annually, for instance, or retreated with a full... Uh, with a full uh, treatment course of three treatments. And so kind of the corollary of that, do endothelial cells will continue to respond at the same level? Um, that might make physiologic sense. Nobody's studied that. This is really the first ever one-year outcome study, so I really can't say for sure. Uh, it seems plausible that that would be the case. Uh, on the flip side, I say there's, you know, like death and taxes, I, I guess uh, there are certain truths and time doesn't stop. And we don't know, is this as effective in a 90-year-old woman as it is in a 55-year-old postmenopausal woman? Nobody's actually looked yet at that. We had a range of ages in our trial, but that's a pilot study. We'll get definitely more data after our randomized control trial because hopefully we'll have the power to also look at response based on age and other health factors. Yes, ma'am. Is this work any better than the estrogen screens and things like that? If yeah. Yeah, so the question is, does this work better than estrogen creams? Again, glad you asked that. That's exactly what we're studying in our new randomized controlled trial, the VELVET study. Women will be randomly assigned to one or the other, and they can't cross over during the study. And we're looking at a variety of validated health measures to see if one works better than the other. My experience from our pilot trial is this works way faster. Whether it works better, I don't know. I would still, still say the standard of care is vaginal lubricants and creams. But that may change in the future if evidence supports, you know, a higher efficacy. So they, have they done studies where they have the vaginal estrogen cream, they did the histology to see if that... Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of evidence for the use of, of vaginal estrogen creams. Those are FDA approved for vaginal atrophy. 
Um, now, I might also say, our studies are designed so that those two things are mutually exclusive. You either get the laser or you get the estrogen cream. In real life, probably, and I know from experience and from a lot of colleagues internationally, many women may decide to have the tr laser treatment and then maintain the good benefit with creams and lubricants so that they get really good response initially and help maintain the benefit with creams. And so in real life, they're not mutually exclusive. They have to be for research purposes. The Velvet study that you mentioned, is that in progress or is that being set up right now for the randomized? Yeah, so the, so the Velvet study, um, whether it's in progress, yes, nationally it's in progress. We will be starting within the next two weeks here at Stanford. Two centers have started enrolling. Those uh, are at uh, the Cleveland Clinic and Washington Hospital Center, uh, MedStar Health in Washington, D.C. And then we were, we just checked today with the, we're through the Stanford in Institutional Review Board and are just working with the um, research management group uh, surrounding the grant. We got a grant for this that'll help pay for the trial. And that should be done soon, within the next week or two. How many people will be enrolled in that? So uh, there will, uh, the question of how many people will be enrolled in the Velvet study, I think we are enrolling 40 people at Stanford, about. The meaning I took from it was perhaps different than you meant, but uh, it was when you were showing the, the results and you said, including some people that could be sexually active with no pain at all. Correct. The so word some with no pain at all made me go, mm -hmm. oh, maybe this isn't as successful as I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question about... I get the question boils down to how effective is this for people for the for sexual pain, uh, and and that's what I was saying is in our study we were studying some patients with really severe atrophy, including cancer patients who had undergone anti-estrogen therapies and so forth. Some of the patients in that trial hadn't been sexually active in many years, and were able to become sexually af active afterward. Um, certainly, if you haven't been sexually active for many, many years and then you become sexually active, you might still have pain. But actually, they were able to have vaginal intercourse satisfactorily in some cases. Some patients weren't sexually active in our trial, so we really can't comment on whether they were able to have vaginal intercourse afterward. And undoubtedly, there will be patients that may have an improvement but still have pain. And of course, undoubtedly, there will be patients that aren't helped with the laser. But the number of patients from our small pilot study and from the data emerging out of Europe suggests that it's highly effective. But there's, unfortunately, I wish there were, but there's no such thing as a 100% an effective therapy. What's the mechanism of the laser now that, I mean, lasers have been used in, say, for facial yeah. and all yeah. kinds of other, what do they think is going on or inside yeah. the body? Yeah, so. it's not a normal right. uh, interaction that cells would have. Yeah, right. So the question of what's going on, I mean, some of my slides alluded to that a little bit, but basically, in a nutshell, what we're creating is tiny little micro injuries, which create a healing process. When healing occurs, brand new cells come in and new blood vessels come in, which is a physiologic response to an injury. Same as if you had a cut, for instance. These are just microscopic injuries. And so we're inducing thermal injuries, basically. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the question of how are we assessing atrophy? Actually, yes, visually, and with a variety of other validated uh, measures I mentioned here. One is called a vaginal health index. That is a five-point scoring system that um, um, measures the lubrication of the vagina, the appearance of the skin, whether it's pale, whether it's uh, red, whether there are bleed, whether the skin bleeds to touch. Mm -hmm. And so there's a validated index that measures that. But we were also measuring it with vaginal pH. Um, and, and some other measures. We were measuring, as I mentioned before, the elasticity of the, the mucosa or the skin, which is how much you could stretch the skin. Because after menopause, you can't. It just cracks and may bleed. Yes, ma'am. Is vaginal atrophy, um, does it always occur in reactions with estrogen? Is it inevitable? Great question. Does vaginal atrophy always occur um, um, in the absence of estrogen? Is it inevitable? Yes, it's inevitable that some vaginal thinning and, and atrophy occurs after menopause, but not all postmenopausal women have complaints of vaginal atrophy. About 50, studies suggest that epidemiologically speaking, about 50% of women who go through menopause will experience bother symptoms of the vaginal atrophy. So that's not everybody, and there are many patients 
of course, maybe half even, that, don't, that aren't bothered. By the way, I might also mention it. For instance, you may have atrophy, and if you're not sexually active, you don't even have any bother at all. Whereas if you were sexually active, you might be bothered because you might find it uncomfortable or dry. Yes, sir. You described um, the exclusion of estrogen creams and lubrication in conjunction with your study, but I wasn't really clear. Mm -hmm. You take people who are maybe using lubricants, start the study, and then for the entire six-year uh, period, they were precluded from using um, lubricants. lubricants as a supplement to the... And is, is that what you said, that, that that's what they were, they were doing? Yeah, so the way the study was designed was... Um, with, with the research trial, we were trying to find out what the specific effects of the laser itself were. In order to do that, if patients had been using vaginal creams of any kind, hormonal or otherwise, they had to get off of them and be off of them for a washout period so that the skin would go back to its baseline state. And then they would go and undergo the laser treatment. For that entire year of the study, they were asked to not use any vaginal lubricants or creams so that we could measure only the effect of the laser. Because if you use the lubricant plus the laser, maybe it was the lubricant that made you better, not the laser. And we were trying to find out, does the laser work? So that's the way the studies were designed. And again, though, in real life, while you can't come in and have cream in your vagina because that would prevent the laser from working properly, patients that have had this done clinically can use whatever they like in their free time. They just wouldn't want to come in and have the treatment if they've used the cream um, you know, right before. So they didn't you know, sign, a, sign something saying they weren't going to use it? Or, yeah, I mean, they, they, they were uh, aware of the inclusion criteria for participating in the trial. We can't ever prove whether a patient did or did not actually use the cream, but most of the patients also wanted to find out whether the laser was an effective therapy and it actually was highly effective even without the creams. Yes? Don't these tissues naturally get thinner as women age? So that if they had the laser treatment at some point, as those tissues continue to get thinner, would they not be as good shape as they were when they first had the laser? Yeah, so the question is, you know, does the, doesn't the skin continue to thin? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the question, I mean, <clears throat> I guess you're getting at the question is, regardless of the laser treatment or not, wouldn't the natural progression be that the skin would get thinner? Um, each time you treat with the laser, um, you may have improvement, but we don't know because we've never studied repeated laser treatments other than the three in the trial and maybe one at one year, although I have talked to patients in Europe who've had, it, who've had progressive treatments. It's certainly true that it's, it's likely that let's say you were 55 years old and you had the laser treatment for bothersome vaginal atrophy symptoms, you felt better, the effect maybe wore off a little bit, you had it again. Let's say for grins, and this has never been done because this was the first ever one-year outcome study, that this laser is still around when you're 90 years old. I doubt that it'll work as well when you're 90 as it did when you were 55. No, so I think there's truth to what you're saying. Tissues will age regardless, exactly. Okay, maybe that's the last question. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. I, I hope you uh, found that helpful and interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Better than the Trump-Clinton uh, debate, no doubt. <laughs>